Uh, good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2022 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Uh, I'm afraid I have to relay uh, the convener's apologies this morning and in his place I will be chairing the committee meeting uh, this morning. Uh, I would also like to welcome Dr Alistair Allen who is uh, attending remotely uh, in place of the Kamina as his uh, substitute. Uh, and also Michelle Thompson is joining us remotely as well. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence from two members of the Scottish uh, Leaders Forum Accountability and Incentives Action Group in relation to their recent report on the National Performance Framework. This is incredibly timely uh, for our committee, given that we are also embarking on an inquiry into the same matter. Um, so, can I welcome to uh, this morning's meeting Jennifer Henderson, Keeper and Chief Executive of uh, Registers of Scotland, and Anna Fowley, uh, Chief Executive of the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Both are here in their capacity as participants in the Scottish Leaders Forum Accountability and Incentives Action Group. It's a very pithy and succinct uh, title, if I might say. Um, uh, can I welcome you both uh, to the meeting and invite Ms Henderson to make a short opening statement. Ms Henderson. Thank you. And we welcome the opportunity to appear before the committee today to discuss the work we've been involved in as part of a Scottish Leaders Forum action group set up to examine how accountability and incentives for delivery of the national outcomes and the national performance framework could be improved. Our action group included representatives from across the public service landscape and as part of our work we have engaged with a wide cross-section of public service leaders. We found that there is no consistent approach to holding organisations to account for their role in delivering the national outcomes, but nevertheless many organisational leaders do seek to show how they are contributing because, and I quote from a colleague we spoke to, it is the right thing to do even if no one asks me to do it. We concluded that organisational leaders are the key to improving accountability for the national outcomes. If all organisational leaders reflect on whether they could do more to show how their organisation contributes to the national outcomes, and if they conclude they could do more, make a change that achieves this, this will underpin a robust system of accountability. We identified that there are four types of organisation that could contribute to a consistent system of accountability for the national outcomes. Those organisations who shape the NPF itself, those who enable through commissioning or funding activities that could contribute to the NPF, those who deliver activities that could contribute to the NPF, and those who scrutinise the activities that could contribute to the NPF. And when we talk about organisations that scrutinise, we do include the role of Parliament. We explored the role of the ADCAR model of change to support the individual behaviour change in leaders of these organisations. Our many conversations with leaders have raised awareness of why accountability for national outcomes matters and created a desire in many colleagues to consider if they could do more to contribute to an effective system of accountability. We have developed a series of good practice one pages to give organisations more knowledge on how they could be more accountable or hold others to account more effectively. And we have developed a maturity matrix to help organisations develop their ability to deliver against the national outcomes. And we have engaged with organisations, particularly those who scrutinise the work of others, to discuss the importance of reinforcing good behaviours in relation to accountability. We have recently published our initial report on our work completed to date and delivered a series of roundtable and one-to-one -one discussions to share our conclusions and obtain buy-in for our recommendations. We believe we've created positive engagement around the need to create greater accountability for the delivery of the national outcomes and an understanding in leaders across the public service spectrum that they can make a personal contribution to delivering this improvement. We plan to continue our work by identifying and documenting specific good practice examples to bring to life the elements in our one pages of maturity matrix, which we hope will further inspire leaders to take action. We're very grateful for the opportunity to discuss our work with you today and hope that our report is a useful contribution to your inquiry and we look forward to answering your questions. Anna, is there anything you wish to add? No, I'm quite happy with that, Jennifer. Thank you. 
Great. Well, look, thank you very much for that opening statement. Uh, and I'll just begin by asking a, a couple of questions before opening up uh, to, to colleagues. But can I say overall, I think it's uh, very, a very useful report and actually quite refreshing to see one that I think is both making proactive uh, suggestions and but also does so in a relatively uh, concise manner. So can I, I, I thank you uh, for that. But, but I also, th it struck me um, that looking at it as a very half full uh, version of the world as opposed to half empty. Uh, you know, talking about what, what it could be and how your organisations could contribute more. However, I would just wonder whether or not you should be having to, to think about those things. Given that the National Performance Framework is a, a creature of, of government, given that it has set out that it, it, you know, this is how it wants to measure it, itself and, and have policy uh, being uh, guided by it, it, you, it, it you, the suggestion is that it's not using that. And it's, especially given that your organisations are largely essentially fulfilling functions of government through uh, you know, various mechanisms, including you know, contracted mechanisms, suggest that the government just isn't using the national performance framework as a means of conducting that engagement and as a, a sort of a, a yardstick um, for, for its interactions with uh, you know, your, your, your members and, the, and the, 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 the organizations that you are working with. Would that be a, a, fair, a fair assessment? I, I think that is a fair assessment, but it's not just government. So I would argue the NPF isn't a creature of government. It's Scotland's national performance framework. It was adopted with, with cross-party support. Um, it's also supported by um, COSLA local government. So I would say that's true. However, all the rest of the system is equally um, in, that, in that space where we use it sometimes, but we don't use it as the really powerful tool that it could be to hold organisations to account. I thought your, your point about um, it being <laughs> a glass half full thing is quite interesting because a lot of people who read it really didn't think, feel it that way. They felt it originally as it being quite a criticism. Um, and and it really isn't. It's about how, how can we improve, um, I think. And I think we all, what we're saying is everybody could play a part in that. We could all do that and we could all do things differently. But the people who ask the questions, like you guys, are the ones who hold the key. I think I, I would just add to what Anna said. I think what happens, in my experience, is the national outcomes frame the work when you set out to do it, but very quickly you are held to account for the specific inputs or outputs that you've specified. And that golden thread of saying, well, are those inputs and outputs actually making a difference to the outcome starts to get lost. It sort of collapses into the kind of very specific targets rather than continuing to track through whether it's all adding up to the outcomes that were intended. So, I mean, just delving into that just a, a, a little bit more, I mean, I guess one of the reasons why perhaps you know, we don't invoke uh, the, the National Performance Framework in, in Parliament that much is because that it is not actually referred to very often either in, in terms of the guidance set out uh, by ministers uh, in the legislation when, when uh, bodies are brought into being or indeed uh, referred to in, in uh, you know, sort of in the regular reporting and here whether it's in ministerial statements or, or things like the, the, the budget. So while I accept your point that, that, that Parliament could be it, ultimately it's the government that have set the frame, and unless they, they invoke it, it it's, uh, it's less likely for, for the rest of us and, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to sort of voluntarily use it. I mean, is that, would you agree with that? I think our findings were it's, you want to try and create a virtuous circle, and it doesn't matter where you start. So I can do an example from my personal organisation, we do call out the national performance framework in our corporate documentation, how we support it, but then we're not really asked about it. So no one takes the opportunity of having put that out there to then ask about it. Other organisations, their auditors will look at that, whether they're achieving the outcomes, but if it's not in their corporate documentation, it's hard to make the link. So I think our finding was 
it, it doesn't matter where you start, but if everybody can capitalise on where there is an opportunity to use a hook of the national performance framework and the national output outcomes in how they ask questions of organisations, you could start to build a virtuous circle of it becoming more of the language used more commonly because the opportunity would be there. So, uh, just my final question. Um, so, uh, I take the, the sort of the broad view that if things are useful, uh, then they get used. And, and I wonder whether or not the fact that, that essentially you're saying that the, the National Performance Framework isn't being used as much as it, it could be is as much a reflection of the content of, of the framework. I mean, does there need to be a re-examination as to whether or not these are the right measures providing the right insights? Because if it was useful and insightful, surely then you know, you know, your, your colleagues and indeed our colleagues in here would be using it much more. I think that there's, that's an interesting point. I, I think it's because it's too hard, because it's not got numbers and it's not got very precise things that you can make precise points about. And actually, I think it'll be a real missed opportunity if when the National Performance Framework is reviewed coming, you know, in the coming months, um, if we focus on rewriting the outcomes again, and, and in, rather than thinking about how and the how we achieve them and how do we get there, I think it's very easy to just rewrite the words, and Scotland's really good at that, particularly civil servants. So it would be quite nice if we move past that and thought about implementation and, and get past that implementation gap. Thank you very much. Ms Henderson, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I'd agree with Anna. I think nobody would disagree that the ambitions set out in the National Performance Framework represents you know, a fantastic ambition for Scotland. I think it's that ability for organisations to make the connection between the specific outputs they're delivering and how can they show they're making a difference. And the other thing I guess I'd reflect is many organisations can very clearly link themselves to one of the national outcomes, but the challenge for organisations should be to think holistically about what they're doing across all of the 11, and are they contributing the maximum they could to each of them, not just sort of hanging their hat on the one that they most obviously are making a difference to. And again, that's the way you, I think you'd achieve a real shift across the country in terms of moving towards delivering that set of outcomes. If everybody doubled down on working out how can they maximise their contribution. Which I think the point about measurability is, is very important and I believe uh, colleagues will come back on that. So uh, with that I'll hand over to John Mason. Hey, thanks very much convener. Um, yeah, first of all I'm, and I'm, I confess I'm not maybe I should be aware of the Scottish Leaders Forum and exactly how it came about or what it's for. I mean I note that the third sector is included but the private sector generally isn't. We, can you just maybe give me some clarification on that? Yeah, so I, I'm a member of the kind of the leadership group for the, the Scottish Leaders Forum, and it's, it's, a, it's a thing that's been around for a very long time, um, probably at least 20 years. But it's um, it's quite amorphous. So it's basically the um, leaders of most public service organisations across Scotland. Originally, just public sector, then expanded to include um, the voluntary sector. But we, it's, we're currently in discussion about how we could include the private sector in that um, without it becoming unwieldy. So it, it's a, a group of people who, who used to meet um, regularly, but also who come together in different groups to do different things. So um, this action group that Jennifer and I are involved in is one where it's just who's interested, you can sign up for it. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite an amorphous group, but... Um, that in a way is quite is the joy of it, but it does need to um, have more business involvement in it. Well, yeah, that's helpful because I mean, when you talk about leadership in Scotland, there clearly is leadership outside the public sector and the voluntary sector as well. Okay, I get that. Yeah, I mean, to follow up the kind of convener's line, um, I, I've always wondered, and I continue to wonder if it's some of the things are just too vague. Now, I know when you go down the levels, you get a bit more detail, but I mean, for example, one of the eleven is we are healthy and active. Now, I don't see anyone around the table or probably anyone in Scotland saying, oh, that's a bad aim, you know, that we shouldn't be healthy or active. Obviously, everyone wants that. But it's so kind of assumed that, that therefore people don't talk about it, really, or at least they don't talk about it in relation to the national performance framework. They say we should be healthy or we should be active or whatever. Is there not a fundamental problem here that it is too vague? I don't think, I mean, there's a question, I think you're right, about how would you measure 
what you know what level of healthiness what level of activity but i think our point in terms of accountability which is where our work was face it was focusing is is every organisation that receives public money in Scotland thinking about their role in helping making people healthy and active? So, for example, are organisations thinking about their active travel policy? So, encouraging, I mean, when we're coming back to the offices, encouraging people to come to work in an active manner rather than drive? Are organisations thinking about their role in supporting the health of their employees and things like that? So, I think our point is every organisation, not just those organisations who have an overt role in in delivering activities or delivering the health system could play a part in delivering that national outcome and if everybody thought about being accountable for their contribution to that you would start to move the dial and I think you're right um, how would you measure when you'd got there well I don't know that you would because I think that the point of the national performance framework is a continuous improvement you could always be more healthy and more active but I think what we're interested in our work is how does everybody demonstrate they are contributing to moving towards that outcome okay I mean I, t I, take, I take the point that uh, you could start anywhere in the circle and um, you know if, if one or two people start referring more to the national performance framework and so on then other people will kind of catch on uh, I mean, I suppose I was a bit surprised that actually the Parliament came out in a positive light and um, Spice, uh, Spice said something about there being... There were some good examples across all categories of organisation, not least in the work of parliamentary committees. And much as I respect Spice, I mean, I've sat in a lot of parliamentary committees which have never mentioned NPF or hardly ever. Um, but I see in your, one of your tables, I think it's on page 15, a parliamentary scrutiny recognising values, individuals and collective whole system delivery. Um, so, so I just wonder where we go in Parliament or if you've got any advice for us. Should, should we just be using the words national performance framework a bit more just to kind of raise awareness? I think there's a bit of that. We, all, we have colleagues from the Parliament um, in, in the action group and they've been very active in what they've been doing. Um, so I, I think that that's very much to be welcomed because that kind of cross-system uh, engagement is, is really good. Um, I think there is a bit of that, but I think in coming back to um, what Daniel said earlier on about um, ministers not leading with those points, I think it would actually potentially be a really interesting thing if opposition politicians or others um, led with, so what's happening on this outcome or whatever, because that's not the, what, what they would be prepared to answer. So you might get um, get more engagement. So I, I do think it's not so much about just dropping in the words, even though I think that's a good start. It's about actually asking the questions about, so how are you contributing to every child growing up loved and respected? Or how are you contributing to, what is this bit of work going to do to achieve this? Um, I think that would be, that would be a, a really good start. Okay, uh, thanks very much. And I suppose if we're talking about uh, where it's working or where it's not working, I mean, I, you don't, well, you might want to praise somebody, you might not want to embarrass somebody, but I mean, can you give us either good or bad examples of where you feel progress is being made, where do, somebody's doing it well, is it, you know, council, health board, SCVO, whatever? Yeah, so we're, we're, that's the next stage, is to collect good case examples. But one of the ones I would, I would commend is Public Health Scotland, um, because they have, all their um, senior staff have got accountability for the National Performance Framework built into their performance appraisal, for example. Um, and their board regularly asks questions about national outcomes. So they, but they are a new organisation. They've set up, been set up with that in mind, and it's much harder, I think, for longer-standing, more traditional organisations to do that. But that is one example that I would point to as at least making a start on it. You wouldn't want to give me a bad example. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And I, th I think the final thing I wanted to just touch on was. Uh, you know, kind of the, the ideal of where we're going on, on, I think it's figure one on page nine of the report, um, it, it talks about budgets and how, I mean, I quite like this, the idea that, uh, you know, there could be a basic level where uh, and pro we're progressing and advanced, and the, then there's the kind of ideal, what, what's called leading edge. And it talks about budgets additionally shared with other organisations, so that organisations are so working together that they're actually sharing their budgets. Now, Ooh, that uh, sounds quite an aspiration. Is that practical? Is it, is it happening? Can it happen? So 
part of it, I should probably just explain, I mean, the, the origin of the maturity matrix on page nine came from we, when we initially were doing this work, we could set out that very clear, where would you ideally like to get to? And a number of the leaders we talked to said, oh, it's all quite demoralizing because we feel we're a long way off that. What are the stepping stones? So we, we worked up the maturity matrix and, as an idea of saying, well, everybody would be somewhere. And if each organization benchmarks themselves and says, well, where are we at the moment again? this maturity matrix what would it take to move one step up on any of the lines is it about being more effective with our budget thinking about how we allocate budget and things like that i think you're probably right that the kind of leading edge view about how you could get to the point of really genuinely sharing budgets across organizations is something that would require working up to but you could imagine i think if you got to the point where a lot of organizations were sitting at the advanced stage and actually given that we've called out that one of the types of organizations who needs to think about making a change are the organizations who do the budget allocation and how the budget system works you could imagine at that point there could be a discussion about how does the budget system allow people to say actually the best way of me delivering my work is to work collaboratively with this organization that means i need a way of allocating some of my budget to them how do we make that happen and i think you then kind of take that final step so it's probably not that practical yet but it could become something that's practical as you move towards it because it becomes the logical next step i think worth reflecting i suppose more generally that when we were doing this work, we started with that kind of mindset of, is it about changing the system? We thought, well, it could be about changing the system, but that's very hard. Actually, if you change the mindset of the leaders within the system, the system will start to change because the people who are making the decisions about how the system works, about the processes within the system, want to do something slightly different and think this bit of the system isn't working, I'm going to figure out how to make a change. So that's how we think we reach everybody at leading edge is because we have the right set of people working on moving the system very gradually. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. I, I, we could spend a lot longer on this, but I'll leave it at that, Convener. Thanks. Thank you, John. Can I bring Liz in at this point? Uh, just following on from that point, uh, Ms Henderson, it, it's, it's not just about how the system is working. It's about the scrutiny of the system. And what I'm interested in, given what you've said this morning and also what Ms Fowley said, are there... Um, processes within this parliament uh, that could be changed to help the additional scrutiny because I agree with Mr Mason that of well, the committees I've sat on in my 16 years here I, I, I don't really think uh, this kind of issue has been mentioned at all um, and that suggests to me either two things that it's irrelevant uh, or secondly that it's too complex and people don't really understand it so just uh, on the basis of Mr Mason's question there do you think that there are procedures within the parliament particularly within the committee structure that could change to in, enhance the scrutiny so yes um, I, I do and I think that, that it sh if the, the, the Parliamentary committees will scrutinise outputs and inputs, and that's absolutely right. There's a, a, a lot of you know, merit in that. However, taking that next, next step and saying, what do those outputs and inputs contribute to? What difference are they making? What people would, you know, in cliché terms, call the so what question, and I would call the and therefore. So we did this, 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 and this, and, and therefore that happened. What's the theory of change? There's a theory of change um, must underpin uh, whether it's overt or not, legislation and policy, which says if we do this, this, this and this, which we are going to legislate for, set and guidance fund, then we're expecting this to happen at the other end. And I think we focus, parliamentary committees, you know, scrutiny bodies, uh, local authorities, uh, focus on the inputs and outputs and, and don't quite get to the end therefore. And I think that would be, it would be adding that, that last kind of, to close that loop, I suppose. That, that's a very interesting point. Do you feel that with any move towards um, longer term spending uh, terms, as in moving from a one year budget to potentially a three year budget, do you feel that that would enhance the process of being able to scrutinise a bit better about how effective, because let's be honest, it's all about money, really, um, how effective the money spend is uh, in, in different areas? Do you, th do you think that would help? 
think it would help immensely. It would help across a whole range of things, you know, for, for all parts of the system, actually. But it would take, it would mean you didn't have to spend so, such a high proportion of your time, again, whichever part of the system you're in, monitoring and thinking about things over and over again and preparing for the next year and preparing for the next year. That's particularly true, you will not be surprised to hear me say, for our sector. Um, but uh, I think it affects everybody. There's a lot of people doing a lot of, you know, reprocessing of things where they, they don't need to do that if they've got a longer time frame to work in. They could be thinking um, much more to the longer term and also able to um, focus on the collective rather than the individual things that they're funding or, uh, or producing uh, guidance for. Uh, Ms Henderson, you said in your opening remarks that um, there were people amongst the leaders groups and people who are operating uh, the National Performance Framework who had felt it was a good thing to do, even if nobody asked them about it. If people are not being asked about it, is there something that needs to happen to ensure that the public are more aware of this and what it actually means? And if so, how would you do that? Because uh, you know, I, I don't think if you asked people out on the street outside National Performance Framework, I don't think anybody would have a clue what it was. I think it's interesting. I mean, we've you know, probably observed in our report, we've slightly interchangeably used the language of the national performance framework and the national outcomes. I wouldn't imagine most people in the public have heard of the national performance framework. I wouldn't necessarily think people have heard of the national outcomes. But if you talked about the, la the actual language of the outcomes, I think that is things that would resonate with people. If you ran through the 11 things that the, the national performance framework is trying to deliver, I think many people in Scotland would say, yes, that's the country I want to live in. So I think that, as you were just discussing with Anna, the sort of way the scrutiny happens of is all the public money being spent as effectively as possible to get to this point is the sort of thing I think the public are exactly interested in. Um, and it's how, I guess, we help make that link between, as Anna describes, the legislation and the policy and the way the money's spent, and then the so what. Is it actually making a difference for the lives of people of Scotland? Because I imagine that's what people in Scotland really care about. And that's how I think you'd get the engagement to be able to explain how those outcomes are being genuinely achieved. And my final point, uh, it, it, in terms of the, the structures of the Parliament and enhancing scrutiny, do, do you feel there is a case to be made, has been made in several years past in this place, that a finance bill would be helpful accompanying uh, the budget process so that there is more opportunity to enhance the scrutiny of exactly where money has gone and how well it has been spent? Do you think that would help? Hmm. I don't think we've thought about that particularly, have we? I think that that's kind of why we value the role of Audit Scotland on the group. But I see what you mean about it being... So I, we can't, I can't answer that question, but I think that is partly the purpose of Audit Scotland to being involved. Um, and I, I also think that you, you know, when you were talking about the public, I've thought for a very, very long time that, that for, for the way that we work um, in democratic fora, the, the public discourse has to change. Because if the public are constantly thinking about how many policemen do we have, how many teachers do we have, how many nurses do we have, all of that's really important, but what's the contribution to the end there for? That's what you guys are going to be asking about, because that's what people are asking you about. And it would be really good if we could sort of somehow build up that public discourse to, to be a bit more informed, I suppose, about that. And I would just make the comment that I think, uh, certainly, again, in my experience here, that sometimes committees feel that there, there isn't the extensive opportunity to scrutinise um, what has happened in a particular policy, um, as in we just don't have time to do that. The committee system is you know, so busy that actually it would be quite helpful if uh, there was a finance bill alongside that to try and uh, help the process. Anyway, th thank you for that. Thank you, Liz. I'll come to Ross next. You. I'd, I'd like to stick with this, the, the role of Parliament in proceedings. You've got the impression so far that we as parliamentarians are perhaps a bit less pessimistic about the role that we have collectively played so far with, with MPF. But I'm interested in the, the feedback from the organisations that you were speaking to. Did any of them reference, that, particularly those organisations who have made sure to, to embed uh, practices around the MPF in their work, did any of them mention that 
the, the idea that Parliament was going to scrutinise them specifically on this uh, was playing a role in their embedding it successfully. No. Yeah, I, I, I thought that would be the, the case. Um, so, yeah, that, that's informative. Um, of the, you mentioned you know, a number of organisations who did include a clear link with NPF indicators in corporate plans, strategy documents, etc. Not all, but, but some. Of those that did, I'm wondering if there's two subgroups there, um, one of which being those who've genuinely built corporate plans and built strategies around these NPF outcomes versus those who came up with a corporate plan or strategy and then worked backwards at the end and said, well, somebody needs to go through and find a couple of indicators that these tick boxes on and include that in the forward. If I'm categorising it correctly, kind of broadly grouping them into these uh, two, what was the balance there? Do you find that of, of the organisations who were actually including this in their corporate plans, how many were, had, had genuinely followed the correct process as opposed to work backwards to tick boxes? I don't think we could give you numbers, but I guess in terms of the approach we took, we tried to sort of follow the trails. So if, if it was in an organisation's corporate plan, we then went and saw what we could find. You know, many organisations nowadays sort of publish things like board minutes online. We then see, saw if we could sort of follow through to say, was this just a one-time exercise where it was in the corporate plan, box ticked? I mean, you know, due, to, due regard for the National Performance Framework as per the Community Empowerment Act, or was it something the organisation was genuinely using to inform its decision-making? And if it was, you would expect to then see board minutes reflecting those kind of conversations that the internal audit process that happens within organisations are looking at it. That was a harder trail to follow and that's why we want to, you know, for the next phase of our work, really pick up those good examples because I think just to come back to Ms Smith's um, point, there should be a, a, ch a joined up chain all the way through where it isn't, you know, it isn't entirely the role of Parliament to do that scrutiny at the end. It should be that boards are scrutinising, internal audits scrutinising, external audits scrutinising, and organisations are making changes as they go to constantly be course correcting, to be ensuring that the way they are spending the money is delivering to best effect against the outcomes they're trying to meet. And then, you know, within that process, Parliament clearly has a role to kind of re be reviewing that. But, yeah, you, you shouldn't have corporate plan and Parliament as just the two ends of the chain with nothing in between. So, yeah, our good practice examples are going to try and find those organisations where there is genuinely that chain that joins it all up and we can show that organisations are using the National Performance Framework as part of their decision making about how are we going to change our work programme, are we, are we going in the right direction. Yeah, there's also a thing, uh, uh, Mr. Gray, but the, um, the, not everyone involved in this reports the Parliament. We focus a bit on the Parliament because we're here. However, when we've got um, we've got local authority membership, we've got and, and me for our sector, we're we're not going to be scrutinised particularly by. Sometimes we might be scrutinised by the Parliament, but it's more likely to be by um, for my sector by a funder or by our own boards who don't report to anybody apart from occasionally Oscar um, or. Uh, councils who, council officers should report into council um, councillors, and uh, obviously Mr. Lumsden is very experienced in, in that. But uh, so it's not just that we are, we are focusing on the role of Parliament today because we're here. But actually, there's a there's a role for local authority um, councillors and for for my board and for for funders particularly to ask. We've never been asked in a, with all the grants we've had from various people. No one's ever asked how it contributes to national outcomes. Uh, on that point about the, the role of local authorities, given that we've established this morning that. Parliament needs to, to step up its work here. Are there any local authorities in Scotland that you would highlight as a particularly strong example of, of embedding this work, particularly into the, the democratic scrutiny element, a, a local authority where the elected members themselves are really engaged in making sure that this is guiding either their work or the work of their partners? We haven't got there yet, we, we, but we do want to get that. I'm confident there will be some, but we've not got to that point yet. Yeah, Thanks. I would, I would just add, if I may, we've had really good engagement from a number of local authorities. The roundtable sessions that I referred to us running when we sort of finished our report and were socialising it, we got a number of local authority chief executives coming along to that who were very engaged and a couple of them we are due to follow up with to try and pick up their kind of examples of what they're already doing that follows what we think people should be doing. I should say, I'm sure Aberdeen City Council are absolutely nailing it, but Mr. Olmson can, can confirm that later on. Jennifer, you, you made a really interesting 
point a moment ago about the, the role of corporate boards uh, in this. And I've mentioned in, in this committee a few times before, particularly in the public sector in Scotland, there seems to be quite a, a wide variety, uh, quite a spectrum uh, of understanding amongst board members about what the role of a, uh, the board over a, a public body actually is. Is it about scrutinising policy decision making, strategic direction setting, etc., or is it purely about corporate governance, HR practices, etc.? Did you find quite a wide spectrum of opinion amongst the board members that you were speaking to about their role in this process? Or is this something that there is some consistency around, whether it's consistently good or bad? So I don't think there is consistency, but I think that's partly because there are a number of different flavours of board that oversee the variety of public bodies that exist. There are sort of accountability boards where the board is the corporate body, there are advisory boards and there are sort of a mixture of things. But again, I think there are roles for organisations within this about when anybody joins any board, how is the national performance framework part of their induction? I mean, again, Registers of Scotland, we make sure we tell our board about the national performance framework, tell them about how we use it and things like that. I wouldn't be sure that that happens everywhere. So I think there'll be a role for organisations like the Public Bodies Unit, who do a lot of work inducting board members to just make sure that the national performance framework and the national outcomes and how it could be used by boards. Because again, that's where you'll get the behaviour change. If new board members coming on board are inspired to think, I have a role in asking my organisation whether I'm advisory or accountability in how that organisation is working to deliver the outcomes in the way it spends public money, we'll start to see that change happening. <coughs> That's actually an excellent example of what was going to be my, my final question, but there may be others that, that you wish to, to give. Um, I'm, I'm particularly keen that we make sure that the outcome of this process is not a burst over the next couple of years of understanding and enthusiasm for the MPF, but then five or ten years from now, when all the individuals involved have moved on to different positions, we have to start the process all, all over again. How, how do we make sure, beyond you know, induction work that you talked about there seems key, how do we make sure that this is embedded permanently into structure and, and, and practice, not just uh, a change in culture, which may be temporary, depending on personnel turnover? And I think our, the, the work we did identified this idea of you get to a tipping point where it, it has become the cultural change. It has become the way things are done around here. And, you know, you'll know you've got there when you've got people joining boards going, well, why is there no discussion about the national outcomes and things like that? So I think there is just that idea that if we can get enough people in enough of the different organisations involved and, you know, people move around within the public sector in Scotland, so they take good practice from one organisation organisation to another, I think you do just get that embedded. Because, I mean, that's the other thing about the National Performance Framework, is it's a long-term set of goals. And that's why I think it's hard for people to kind of maintain a focus on it, because it is a lot easier to do your short-term input and output on an annual basis. I do think longer-term budgeting will help, because you can set out what you plan to achieve over several years, rather than just in the year ahead. And then I think you can start to get to that point where you're looking really long-term at what organisations are delivering. And boards, for me, Mr Greer, are, you know, they're custodians and stewards of the organisation for the period they are there. They should be leaving the organisation in a better state they found it and handing it on to be taken forward. So over a period of board rotations, you should see in any organisation a real set of progress that that organisation has demonstrably made a difference in how it's contributing to the national outcomes. Excellent. Thank you. That's all from me, Convener. Thank you very much. I'll now turn to Douglas. Thanks, Convener. No surprise if I am going to ask about local government. Um, one, uh, of course, Council of the Year back in 2020, but uh, I don't like to bring it up much, Convener. Um, one of the things that struck me when I was reading the report, and uh, it, it's a question I'd asked the Deputy First Minister, um, I think it was last month, Obviously, the local authorities have the local outcome improvement plans. And then at a national level, we have the, the MPF. And it's, it, it, when we are commissioning services from a, you know, at, at a local authority level, you know, or commission services, you know, one of the first questions is, you know, how does it align to the, the law? How does it contribute to the outcomes we're trying to um, achieve there? You know, we don't really ask about the, the MPF. And I'm just trying to think, is that, would you, and, and that's our golden thread that we have gone through, you know, at the, at the local government level. 
So it's almost like there's two chains. There's this, this Scottish government chain that seems to be broken almost when it goes down to local government. And then we have a chain down at local government. Would you think that's fair? Or, you know, would, did, your, did your members say anything about the LOIP and how that wasn't aligned to the MPF at all? Or, or I guess it is, it's almost like VHS and Betamax. They are doing the same things, but they're different. And I guess it's how we to almost combine them together. Yeah, I, I think that's that's fair. I think that's, this this is a bit that really intrigues me. I'm really fascinated by how it all works it, in dovetailing with local government as well. Um, I think that LOIPs probably do align with the national performance framework because part of what's been discussed already is so broad. The, the LOIP in Aberdeen will be looking at how you make people healthier and more active, and you might not call it that, but you'll act, the, the outcomes will be pretty similar, I would think. But I think it has to work at a local level in words that are relevant to your local area. So even if it's, it's less overt, I think the, if it's there and it's embedded, um, then that's, that's only going to help to achieve the outcomes. But I do think it is, it's quite intriguing, that whole kind of... How, and it's really fascinating for me that all of you are regarding the NPF as a government thing. I, I'm, going to, I'm taking that away to reflect on because, because the impression that, that we have is it's, it's not just a government thing, it's, you know, it's an everybody thing. So maybe we're being naive in that. Um, but I, 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 I take your point and I think that's why we delve, need to delve more deeply into it because it's it really fascinating. And hopefully useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, it was it was really useful, and um, you know it's back to the awareness as well. But at a local level, we're pushing the awareness of the LOIP. And over the last five years, you know, especially at budget time, everyone was quoting the LOIP back to me, which so obviously had worked. Everyone knew that if they're looking for funding, it had to align to the LOIP. But I guess that's so. Organisations are maybe not aware so much of the MPF locally because they know that the LOIP's there and they have to align to that learn from you? Maybe. <laughs> how did you achieve that in Aberdeen and how can we replicate that in the, at a national level? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not being flippant, I'm actually yeah. thinking that. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but then it's still, there's a, a, a link that's broken between the, the MPF and the LOIP, because then still organisations will be aware of the LOIP locally, but maybe less aware of the MPF mm. at a national level. And it's how, they, how we combine them better. Mm -hmm. So yeah. people are aware of both, not just yeah. one or the other. <laughs> I don't know how to no, fix that. No, but that's a really good point. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I guess you know one of the things we did with Lloyd, you know, it was it was embedded at the start of the project, and I, I think you you mentioned that in your your report. Any project should be embedded right at the start. So in terms of the MPF, the way I read it, it's almost like a it's measured at the end, you know, how did that project align to it, as opposed to right at the start, how is it going to achieve the outcomes of the MPF? Any ideas how we change that? Well, I think it's back to what, what we've been saying about sort of like chipping away and incrementally just gradually introducing questions, whether it's internal auditors, whether it's um, you know, council committees or parliamentary committees or whether it's scrutiny bodies or funders. Um, I keep harping on about funders because that is the most relevant to, uh, to my sector. Uh, how, how you gradually, if you gradually chip away and get questions being asked, then I think that will produce a culture shift. Mm -hmm. And is it a case of, as soon as there's an application for any funding, it should be quite clear how it's going to align to the MPF? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that's missing just now as well. Absolutely. What I would like to avoid is it, be is it becoming a kind of tick box um, because and as, as, uh, as you described earlier on in terms of retrofitting things to make it look like they were to do with the NPF. But if we're going to be asking about um, sustainability, we're going to be asking about fair work, we're going to be asking about, you know, blah, 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 so many different things. You don't want it just to be a whole list of things that people have to retrofit stuff to comply with. They need to, need to buy into the purpose of it. Yep. OK, thanks, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Douglas. I believe Alistair Allen has a, a question that you'd like to ask. It may have been covered by others, but we heard there that um, NPF should be an everybody thing, and um, I'm not going to be unwise enough to suggest um, that the NPF should ever capture the, the public imagination. I'm not sure that would be an entirely healthy situation um, anyway, but um, I think what has come through is the importance of, of awareness amongst community-level bodies who are actually spending money or perhaps applying for money. 
Um, do you think that there's anything that the government could do to express the the purpose of all this in terms that, that do capture the imagination of, of, of people at a community level um, perhaps more effectively? Yeah, I, yes, I suppose I do think that. I think it's 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 an awareness raising thing for government, but in a way, as a bit like discussed with, with Mr. Lumsden, how do you make it relevant to those people? So <clears> there's, it's it's not about kind of those those people out in communities need to understand what we're doing. It's more about how can we make this relevant to those people and help them understand their contribution. I mean, I keep thinking about some of the really small organisations that are members of SCVO, like <coughs> village halls, for example, or walking groups, rambling groups, things like that. They are all com absolutely contributing to the national outcomes, but they don't know that, and they maybe don't need to know that. But whoever is kind of monitoring the national outcomes needs to know that and needs to know how to capture that information. So I suppose it's a bit about people need to feel part of contributing to a better Scotland, but do they need to know the absolute detail of which outcome they're contributing to or what they need to do? I don't know. I think that's um, that might be overcomplicating it. Jennifer, am I wittering there? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I, 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 would, I would agree with Anna. I think what's potentially missing is the ability to really capture all the contributions that are already happening because organisations the type that Anna describes just have probably mm. never heard of the National Performance Framework, probably don't know about the national outcomes and therefore don't understand that the thing they are doing is making that contribution. They are making life better for their community. I mean, Scotland is a set of communities and if life becomes better in every community, life in Scotland becomes better. And I think just going back to Mr Lumsden's question, there is absolutely a clear link between local improvement plans and the National Performance Framework. They are all just part of the same spectrum, aren't they? What is making life better for the people of Aberdeen will be a bunch of things that are related to the things that are on the National Performance Framework. And I think one of our observations in the work we've done is the way to deliver the best outcomes might be different in different parts of Scotland. You won't have the same solutions everywhere, which is why local improvement plans are so important. And then there will be things that can also be improved on a national basis. And then at a sub-level to local, there'll be really niche community things where things can become better for individual communities. But I think if you showed anyone in Scotland the set of outcomes, they would be able to go, well, I buy into all of that and I can say where I think I see that happening locally. Do, Dr. Allen, do you have any further questions? No, thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much. So I don't believe any uh, members have any uh, further questions. So I, I may just ask uh, one final thing. I, listening with interest and reflecting a little bit, and in, in combination, I think, some of the things that were raised by uh, both uh, John Mason and, and uh, Douglas Lumsden uh, about the, the, the structure of the performance framework. I mean, I think, I think John's observation that it's that, that, that the first level is very, very broad, uh, but then actually, you know, stepping into it, uh, you, you get into actually very, a very kind of micro level very, very quickly. You know, you look at each of the individual indicators and actually a lot of them are not just one measurement, they're actually a number of different measurements, they're presented in words, and actually just thinking about what Douglas was saying, it, it, they're not all, but a, they're largely outputs rather than inputs. So I, I, I was wondering two things. First of all, does there need to be more focus? And I think in particular with interactions, you know, it, I think maybe obvious for your members, uh, Anna, that, that, that you know, where they're relevant, but you know, thinking about registers of Scotland, I mean, there are so many of the different indicators that potentially Register Scotland could touch on. I don't think it would be necessarily helpful for, for, for you as an organisation to be looking at all of them all at once. So do, do we need to actually almost task uh, individual organisations or bits of the government with looking at particular bits or, or particular measures and, and actually almost sort of giving a bit of a mission? The, the other thing I, I was wondering and, and thinking about that, that, that inputs and outputs um, uh, uh, perspective. Do, do we need to be thinking rather than just about outcomes, about actually how we measure change, uh, whether or not there actually needs to be focused on, on identifying measures which are actually 
uh, will change other things, or, or, or at least having a perspective saying we believe we can change this area by doing X or Y. So, for example, in health and well-being, it, you know, we getting people you're measuring kind of exercise or even uh, you know the, the, the consumption of, of uh, fruit and fruit and vegetables because that is an input that will result in the output so I'm just wondering if those two sort of thoughts are, are ones that your group might 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 consider or whether you thought they were were welcome thoughts yeah I think I think one of our other observations is if, if you start to dive into the national outcomes, everything can become connected to everything because you look at one national outcome around um, you know, poverty, but then other outcomes around fair work and business clearly have a connection. So I think there are... You know, there is a danger, I think, if you start to carve it up, that you miss the idea that the whole of the national performance framework and the outcomes sort of they're all self-reinforcing I suppose in some ways but you're absolutely right I think um, Mr Johnson that yeah it's impossible for any organisation to sort of go line by line saying what do I do I think most organisations will target and say I'm predominantly contributing to this outcome and I'm thinking about whether I'm meeting those indicators but then I'm also looking I'm not missing the opportunity to ensure that where I can I'm making a broader a broader contribution uh, across as much of the performance framework as I can um, but yeah I'm not sure how useful we think it would be to sort of carve it up and look at it as a set no. of individual things but I think that measuring the change is really important and I, in, in my mind it, and that gets to the end therefore but it's it's similar to if you're looking at um, children's education if all you're doing is measuring exam results that's not a great indicator if you measure where somebody started and where they got to and how much progress they made that's a far better indicator of the quality of their education or or their then their trajectory into adult life so i think there's a that kind of that was the analogy that was popping into my mind but i think that measuring that change and measuring progress that would be a massive step forward on um, and we need to think about who might work out how to do that rather than us thinking we can do that i think yes i'm going to guess another analogy would be uh measuring acceleration than, rather than speed. It's, exactly. You know, one is a dynamic measure, one is a static. Um, so I've got a, a, a question uh, from Michelle. Michelle is, is travelling, uh, <laughs> hence I, I, I'm relaying this. But her question is, is, is this. Uh, why has the Scottish Government not mandated all organisations to state exactly uh, all organisational plan, how all organisational plans align to the MPF and where possible that funding uh, settlements are uh, predicated on that. Um, sh surely this would change behaviours. Well, I suppose you could argue that it is mandated in that the Community Empowerment Act says all organisations have to have due regard for the national performance framework and the national outcomes. But I think the question, I suppose, is what does due regard mean? Um, and in terms of budgeting, I mean, when you put into the sort of budget process, there is a requirement to specify how your budget is in support of the national outcomes. But I think our, our point, I suppose, is then where the follow through is on all of that. And as I described to Mr. Greer, it's not enough to just set it out because then it's almost a tick box exercise. You then actually need to be held to account right the way through the chain to a make sure you're doing it. But I think your point, Mr. Johnson, that it's actually making the change required because you could be spending money doing some of this stuff and making no change at all and that isn't well money well spent so i think the measurement of the change and the measurement of the rate of acceleration towards the delivery of these national indicators and the national outcome is the thing that really has to follow on from just specifying what your organization does and, and, and as i said in my opening statement Lots of organisations we spoke to say they specify what they do, but then if no one ever asks them about them, asks them about it, asks them whether it's good enough, asks them whether they're making enough progress, just writing it down doesn't make any difference, I don't think. Well, there's also the incentives part of our working group. So nearly everything we've done and everything we've talked about has been focused on accountability because that's where we can see that you can make a difference. And that goes to Ms Thompson's question, which is about how can we make them? Now, if we didn't need to make them, if there was an incentive and we could somehow get people to buy it and do it willingly, then that would actually be more productive. Um, but 
we have kind of struggled to work out what the incentives might be other than not being in front of the public audit committee or not being on the front page of the daily record. So we're, we're working on that at the moment. <laughs> I think we all prefer carrots to sticks. Yeah, um, indeed. I, I believe uh, Douglas Lovinson has a, yeah. an additional question. Yeah. Thanks, Camille. Thanks for allowing me back in. Uh, and I was reading your blog last night. And uh, one thing that did st um, stand out was we know that investing time and money in prevention is essential if we are to address poverty, inequality and climate change. We've known it for years, even decades, but we don't make that important shift because the benefits don't show up with that, within that electoral cycle. And it does mean, and it means moving spend from immediate pressures. Yeah. And that's something I, I, I agree with uh, completely. But it's something that the, the government, you know, claimed to be taking prevention and early intervention yeah. seriously. So do you think they're not doing enough and what more could they do around prevention then? Well, I, I think it's, it is really difficult because, especially just now in the financial climate that we're in, because you have to shift spend. And to shift spend from the acute end of things, whether it's health or justice or, you know, that, to shift it into prevention is really difficult when you've, you've then still got that the pile of people who are ill or in prison or whatever. But I absolutely think we do, we need to somehow... Um, make that shift. I mean, it was in the Christie report, and we're still talking about it now. So, yeah, you, you sense some of my frustration in that. And it, but it is, I think it's a spend to save thing. So you would spend it now to save later, because what we're doing at the moment is funding um, acute, ser acute services in whatever sector to deal with the problems that are created by not investing in prevention and that might be investing energy and time as well as money but it is often uh, money so um, and I think part of that is because of that public discourse thing that we talked about earlier on where there's not so many people are going to vote or withhold their vote on the basis of prevention they're much more likely to do it on the basis of, um, of immediate priorities that they see in their communities because I've got a feeling we, we we do it within sort of silos almost um, but, you know, I, I keep banging the drum in, in this committee that, you know, more money spent on local government can help save money on health and, and justice yep. later. But I guess that's harder for the government to do because that might shift some resources from, from one pot to the other. Yep. OK, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and with that, unless there's any other uh, questions, um, that draws uh, to close the evidence session today. Can I thank both that Anna Fowley and Jennifer Henderson uh, hugely for their contribution. I think it's been a very interesting discussion and I think uh, there have been a number of themes and issues that we have alighted on that we will certainly follow up in our own inquiry work uh, on the National Performance Framework. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your contributions uh, and with that uh, we conclude the public part of uh, today's meeting. The next item of our agenda uh, which will be discussed in private is consideration of our work programme and so we now move into private session. <laughs>